This is Robert Demers for Conman here at the Fantasia International Film Festival, and I'm here with Gabriel Carrere, the writer and director of The Demolisher, as well as the producer Christian Burgess. How are you both doing today? Good. Good. Awesome. How are you? Pretty good. Awesome. How's the festival been treating you it's, so far? It's amazing. It's the best genre festival in the world. They, they treat you amazing here. The, the audiences are the best because we're audience scores ourselves, so it's just basically you know, a huge theater of you. Of me, you know, so we all like the same films. It's it's amazing. Couldn't ask for anything better, for sure, for the film, for the world premiere. Yeah. Speaking of the premiere, it's just days away. Yeah. How excited are you both? Very excited. Um, a little nervous, uh, but you know that's that comes with the territory with any film. Um, we came a few days earlier just to enjoy the other films in the festival too, because there's so much stuff to look at, and um, you know to even promote the film on Monday. Screens at 7:15 p.m. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm nervous. I'm just kind of anxious to get it over with because this is the first time an audience will have seen it. We never even had any private screenings or anything like that, so it's going to be interesting to gauge what they think and what they don't think because the name is a little deceiving. So we'll see how that it's, goes. It's a little bit of a humbling experience, a little surreal. It hasn't quite hit me myself. Um, I'm really, I am a little nervous because, like Gabriel's been saying, it, it's the first time like an audience is going to see it, plus uh, press and like the movies out there in the festival circuit. And now it begins because we're having the world premiere, so it is. Uh, it's, it's been an interesting journey this film, so it, it's nice to see it sort of start its next journey, which yeah. is the audience part. Yeah. That's the biggest part. That's why you make movies, right, for the audience. So hopefully they catch something in it that they like, and hopefully they like it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, can you please tell the, our audience a little bit about the film? Oh, story-wise, um, The Demolisher is a, is a simple vigilante tale when it comes down to it. Um, it's about a, a husband, a man whose um, wife gets in an unfortunate incident and uh, he kind of tries to avenge her um, injury, so to speak. Um, so the movie kind of takes place though you don't see them happy before. The movie takes place midway, when he's already kind of lost his mind, when he's kind of already disturbed. Um, the brink of the relationship in the gutters. Um, and with what happened to her, it kind of left her in a, a state of disability. So it really shows you the vigil vigilante's other side of his home life, like how he's dealing with her, what's, he, what's his day-to-day -day routines um, with her, especially if she's, she's injured, um, she's in a wheelchair. So um, it shows that side, it just shows the frustration and the madness built up in this one soul, this one person, and how he kind of lashes out at the most random and even innocent people, right? So you, you have outlets in life, as human beings we have outlets, and sometimes we react in ways toward people that don't deserve it. Um, and that goes with this vigilante. So the film kind of focuses on that attribute, um, on his character and what he goes through, and, and the innocent person that he projects this madness on. What was the inspiration to create this film? Um, I think it was, um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not going to lie, like I love, I love movies like, you know, The Exterminator and a lot of vigilante films. I love, I collect VHS tapes. I love everything from the 80s and 80s horror. So there is, there is that influence in this film, but it's not at the forefront. Um, so I took su subject matter from some of those films that I love and then just translated it um, in a way that um, we could. Um, also want to do an exercise with the actors and let them breathe on frame and create each shot as like a painting so to speak and not have to worry about cutting to multiple angles to get different coverage. I wanted the actors to really explore uh, the characters within the frame and see what that came out with. So that was kind of an inspiration well just as an ex exercise or an experiment in that with working with the actors. So that was something I wanted to do. Since this is a vigilante film, yeah. was there certain aspects of that type of character you want to either touch upon or even avoid? Um, I wanted to, uh, number one, I, wanted, I really wanted to avoid the hardcore violence that's in a lot of vigilante films. This film does have the hardcore violence, but it's very minimal. Like, it's not there. That's not at the forefront. And if you want to see a hardcore vigilante film, I mean, go watch some of the Punisher films or Death Sentence with Kevin Bacon. Those are awesome freaking movies. You know what I mean? Like, why try to do something like that when it's been done and it's been done amazing? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, it could be fun doing it, but 
I didn't want to do that. I wanted to try a different angle on it and explore another avenue with this character. So, um, yeah, like the violence is kind of ramped down, but it's there when it's needed and it's peaked. Um, yeah. Because essentially it's about like an everyday man who's sort of coming to terms with tragedy in his life. And, um, you know, like he, he's not a superhero. He's, he's just an every guy. He doesn't, you know, there's no martial arts and no superpowers like he's just a, a regular guy just yeah. dealing coping you know, with tragedy there is a hyper violence to it like some of the action scenes in it are a little unrealistic like especially there's a scene in the movie towards the end where there's an auto body shop um, and even in the end I don't want to give anything away but that is added there intentionally um, because it's almost it is like a homage to again the movies that I really like you have this guy this vigilante and he's he go, he's goes through shit, and it's like, this is the reason why he's called the Demolisher. This is why the movie's titled that, because he can do anything. Like, it's, there's almost that fantas fantasized invincible aspect to it. What was your most memorable moment during the production? Oh, boy. I think, you know what it is? The most memorable moments are uh, when we're filming, a lot of the movie takes place at night, especially with the chase scene uh, with actress Jessica Vano. She killed it. Um, so we'd be out in the city, different cities at night, filming from, you know, midnight till 5 a.m. We're 11 till 5 a.m. and finding streets that there's no one on. Um, but there's a few shots in the film that are completely unplanned. You know, we would have an HMI set up, a huge light set up on the street and stuff, and we'd be shooting the demolisher. And there's one scene in the film, completely unplanned, where he's charging toward the camera in an alleyway. And behind him, a police car drives by and makes their little alert sound. And it just goes in frame perfectly. And it was unplanned. It was, we didn't even know there was a cop car. And the whole movie we wanted that also, like, it was funny because in the script, the whole movie wanted the sense of the cops are kind of around. So just to get that one shot, and I think it was in the second take where a cop car passes in the alley and you see it was definitely something we, that was probably the most memorable moment because you can't even, I mean, if you had a massive budget, you could pay for that, but... Like, it just worked out beautiful. And it, was, it was free, unplanned, and we used it. It was free and unplanned, and I feel like a lot of the stuff in this film were, were free and unplanned, too. So that was probably... Moments like that were probably the most memorable, where things just happened organically on set, and, you know, that's, that's probably it. And it just helps, helps the story and the visual component, because the movie's very visual. So There is a... a one, one of the scenes I really like in the film is, again, it's like this chase sequence that um, we have a lot of Steadicam use as well. And these really cool shots, it makes it look like we close down streets. And, you know, there's no extra. It's like these desolate streets. And, and our lead actor, Ryan, is just walking down, storming down the streets and uh, as the demolisher. And, and it creates this, like, whoa. It's actually in one of our, a couple of our posters. And it's just like this... All, you know, like he's such a presence. You know, like That's he really thing, yeah. gets into this character. And it's like him just, you know... Yeah. The demolishers coming down the street, and it's yeah. it's kind of scary, but like it's very in, um, intriguing at the same right. time. Yeah, it's almost like the because where he is in the street and stuff, we almost wanted to make the movie in the in, in the movie when he's around and in these environments, we almost wanted the environments to be intimidated by him. So we have a lot of wide shots, and we almost wanted to be like nothing can touch him. You know, it's always like away from him because he's such a powerful entity. So when he's walking down the street, it just seems everyone's just moving away from him, you know? Um, it's sort of a, a, in comparison to, you know, Bruce the every guy yeah. versus him when he puts on the Demolisher outfit. Yeah. What was the most difficult aspect of the production? Oh, the locations. There were so many locations in the film and doing that in two and a half weeks, I mean, like, there's tons of movies that have that problem too, you know? It's, well, not problem, challenges. You have so many locations that you want to do and it's very so little time just trying to get what you need out of those locations that's that's the toughest right so you have to just plan accordingly and balance that out and time and time yeah yeah because you know you only have a mall for so long and you only have a doctor office for so long and you only think it's yeah that's that's the toughest part is the locations how many they were yeah. um, some of the setups we had right? in, in oh, the auto yeah. body shop where yeah. one setup i remember i was on set that day and it was uh I think we it was like a six hour setup, yeah. And we did one, and it's just that's a majority of your of your shoot day. Yeah, yeah. and there's just even creating like there's moments in the film where even just creating moonlight, you know, um, that's always tough too. Is to take in a location that you have you have and you have to use it and then utilizing that to your best advantage and just 
just trying to, you know, create something surreal out of that location. So even though there's might maybe not be a, like a window on the roof, um, maybe pretend there is and blast an HMI up there to make it look like there's moonlight coming through. So that's always a challenge to try to think creatively with those locations you have and having so many locations. So if you want to mention, uh, talk about post-production, was a bit of a challenge for you? Yeah, um, post-production was actually okay. It was pretty easy. Um, there, there was one challenge because we had a lot of logos in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we had to blur them out. And that was really hard um, because, number one, you know, you don't have the time, especially when there's sales and stuff happening, to contact all that. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes the easy route is just to blur it out. And our post guy, Scott McIntyre from Smack Studios, he was amazing. Like, he went in. And uh, I think that at the end of the film on the rooftop, uh, no one will know this, but there's a building that's in the background originally on that building there's this huge logo and sign on it and he totally took it out like there was no way we we're going to get clearance for it and we shot it knowing like okay let's hope we can get, let's hope we can do this <laughs> you know what i mean or we're going to have to use that 4k uh the 4k uh you know mode and just keyframe in a lot and then <laughs> you know get rid of it so yeah that was that was probably a, a challenge in post to to balance that stuff out yeah what kind of release will be looking at the film after Fantasia or even uh, future festivals? Uh, right now we're just touring the film, the festivals. Um, we, the movie got uh, picked up by Raven Banner Entertainment. Um, so they're repping Turbo Kid. Uh, what else are they? There's so many awesome genre films. Um, so it's awesome that um, you know they, they accepted us in, under their wing, under their family. Um, even when it's two, two, two totally different films. Um, so we, we've made some sales overseas. I don't know if I can say what territories yet. Um, so I'll just say I can't say them, but we, we do have a few territories locked um, for next year's release. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, now until maybe mid next year, we'll have a good festival run. And then by the big early 2016, you'll, it'll be coming out, I think, on Blu-ray and DVD and some of the territories that we have so far. Yeah, it's it, the f- the festival run is just literally just starts on on the twenty seventh of this month. Yeah. So it hopefully it has a really uh, nice, healthy, long run in the festival, and and word yeah. of mouth gets out there about us. Yeah, and we're just looking and, to yeah. play the movie in any theater. Like you know, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, some huge festival or anything like that, too, right? So um, we're just looking to get the film played at any theater for a while and have fun with it, you know, because it is a theater movie because the sound design in it is really important. Um, Glenn Nicholas, the guy who did the score, um, he's based in the UK and he did an amazing job on the score. He did some remixes for The Prodigy, Nine Inch Nails, Depeche Mode, and he just took it over and made it his own thing. So we really want to honor that as much as we can. And the best way to honor that is having it in the theater. Um, you know, you can have an awesome sound system at home, but. Yeah. yeah, we're we're even a little wary of giving out screeners because you know it doesn't give the film uh, enough justice by having it on a smaller screen yeah. or just like per person watching on their tablet or their yeah. PC or you know it is it is a big screen theatrical experience yeah. and we want people to 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 see it as much as we want For sure. as we can anyway. Yeah, I know you have a number of films upcoming in development. Can you tell us anything about that? Uh, we have a few. Um, uh, I can't say. I wish I could say the one. Uh, Leadhead, maybe. Yeah, there's le- there's one that Christian and I've been working on for like four years now. It's called Leadhead, it's about a guy who wakes up. Um, and there's a bullet perfectly lodged in his brain, and uh, he goes out and he doesn't remember anything. Doesn't remember anything in his past, and he meets all these quirky characters. He meets this one of the main leads, Erica, and he just gets thrown through a twisted journey of insanity meeting all these crazy characters and is like trying to piece together his past and reuniting with two of his old friends and even them they're kind of twisted as well one of them is a recovering neo-nazi skinhead who kills child molesters so he used to be a skinhead nazi skinhead and now he feels bad about that so now he kills child molesters and redemption so the movie's not really a horror film it's just like a crazy it's just a crazy world that's you know very strange so we're working on that and that's just a it's not a big movie per se, but it's just something that we're always tweaking. And then we have a few films in development, but I can't. I wish. I wish we could. Totally understand. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to know more, just go to latefox.com because as soon as we know stuff, we promote it and pimp ourselves out. Like. Yeah, we're really excited. We do have. Uh 
uh, we have some other collaborations with some other people that we know. Yeah. And that's why we don't really want to talk about it right now. But uh, we do have some stuff in the pipeline that we're really kind of pumped and excited for. Yeah. P- p- fan- I can say this. People who are fans of, like, the movie Drive and Only God Forgives um, will, like, really like the stuff that, that's going to come out. We hope. We hope. <laughs> Thank you so very much for talking with us, and I wish you all the success with the upcoming premiere. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Robert. Appreciate your time.